Good morning to all of you. I love when I have the opportunity, when I've been given the opportunity to come here to Riverside. Thank you for being here, for smiling at me. I see a lot of familiar faces, and I want to welcome all those who may be watching the live stream. We are so glad that you're joining us as well. And I also want to thank everyone who has prayed for me. I've received some text messages and phone calls. And I have to tell you, I have needed those prayers. I have depended on those prayers. My confidence is in God who has been hearing those prayers. And by his grace, I pray he answers those prayers. Because I don't know about you, but did you feel the gravity of these, um, of these chapters, the holiness of these chapters? I know I did, and as I was praying um, for myself, actually, every time I opened up the Word and started studying or would write some thoughts down, I would just stop and I'd say, Lord, I need you. I need you to illuminate your Word to me. And not only did I pray for myself, but I prayed for you as well, that the Lord would be working in your hearts, preparing you for this message as well. And if you came in here this morning and maybe you feel a little confused about something or there's some ambiguity as you were, you know, trying to work your way through these chapters, I'm praying that the Lord would bring clarity to all of us this morning because he wants us to understand his word. He wants to reveal who he is. And so I'm praying that you would actually have an aha moment. Do you know what that is? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like you can be reading something or hearing something, and then all of a sudden it's like the light goes off, right? And you go, oh, that's what it means. And I know a lot of times, you know, we could maybe even be familiar with something, and God could still work an aha moment even in that. Um, I want to share with you an aha moment that I had about 15 years ago. And when I was telling my husband that I was going to share this with you, he looked at me, he goes, Melanie, are you sure you want to share that? <laughs> so I'm being very vulnerable right now, okay? I'm going to tell you about my aha moment. Um, about 15 years ago, right here at Harvest, my son was in vacation Bible school. He was about five years old, and he was up on the hill, and I volunteered to be the teacher in that five-year-old classroom. Now, those of you who have ever, you know, um, worked with children, you know to capture their attention and to keep their attention, you have to be very overt, very demonstrative with your, with your actions, right? Very dramatic. And so there I was teaching this very story in Exodus about the Passover. And I'm here with these kids. I don't have a felt board. I don't have any props. I'm the prop, okay? And so they're all looking at me, and I still remember the door of the classroom that I was in, and I was telling them how how the people were told that they needed to take a hyssop branch. And I said, a hyssop branch is, think of like a tumbleweed. It was like used as a giant paintbrush. And they were supposed to dip it in the blood and then paint the sides of the door and put it over the top of the door. And then when God came by, he would look and he would see the blood on the doorpost and he would pass over that home and make sure that it was safe. And as I was telling them that God would pass over the home, it, I had that aha moment. That's where they got the word pass over. God was passing over. You guys already knew that, right? Okay. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> um, but you know what, I hope that's not a spoiler alert because that really is the culmination of this story because we're going to see that God is a God who provides, who redeems, who saves his people, who um, makes provision for his people. But again, I don't want to get ahead of myself because there's so much in, this, uh, in these two chapters. And I am hopeful that you had a chance to read it in its fullness when you were at home and that you had an opportunity to fill out your lessons. You know, those lessons are, are a tool for you to use just to dig a little deeper. And I know that your group leaders... Um, I can speak on their behalf because I know that they love when you do your best to do that, um, to do that lesson. And you know what? If you come and there's, there's times where you don't understand something or you have to skip something, grace abounds. Come and we'll reason out, we'll reason together. My favorite thing is meeting with my small group, having my pen ready, and just gleaning from the ladies in my group as we all learn together. You know, there's a lot um, in this story, but for the sake of time, 
I broke it down into three points that I think will move us through the story. And my first point is the reliability of God's word. The reliability. My second point is the response to God's word. Response. My third point is the remembrance of God's word. Remembrance. And if you want an even easier outline, just remember this. Know it, do it, and don't forget it. And I'll repeat that as we, as we move on. But point number one, God's word is reliable. We need to know it. Did you know that God is a God of revelation? He tells us who he is, what he does, and why he does what he does. He doesn't hide from us, but he reveals himself to us through the pages of scripture. We can put our full trust in him and his word because it's reliable and it's sure. Week after week, chapter after chapter, verse after verse, I see God building his reputation, and it's one of faithfulness. You know we all have a reputation, right, ladies? We all have a reputation. It's something that we're known for. And don't all of us have a friend that has a reputation for being late? Like it doesn't matter what time you set the meeting or even a party for that matter. You just know that that girl is not going to be there on time. And her reputation, because it's her pattern, is that she's always late. So you don't wait for her to get started, right? But then you also have those friends that you know that if they tell you, I'm going to be here at a certain time, I will be there, I will show up, you can take them at their word because they are dependable and they are reliable. The Lord is never too late and he never makes a mistake. And even when he doesn't work within our time frame, our timeline, where we think, okay, you should be acting now, you should be moving, you should be changing the situation, even when he doesn't act according to our way or the way that we think he should handle a situation, he's never too late. And he never makes mistakes. Throughout this study, we see that God is revealing who he is, first to Moses, and then to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And then he wants to reveal himself to his own people, the Hebrews, because they need to know who their God is. His reputation was going out to the whole world through the demonstration of his mighty acts. And we started looking at them last week when we looked at the plagues, and we're going to continue next week because God's going to continue to be revealing himself through these mighty acts. Back in chapter 4, God had called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. And he told Moses, Moses, I'm going to use you. You're going to go to Pharaoh. You're going to perform these miracles. He's not going to listen to you. But then in verse 22, it says this. It says, then you will tell him, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I command you, let my son go so he can worship me. But since you refused, I will now kill your firstborn son. Now, the significance of this passage is that God told Moses this when he was still in the desert. He was a shepherd still. He wasn't in Egypt. But God foretold. He, he, he set forth his word. His word is prophetic, and it will come to pass. Last week, we focused on the nine plagues, the nine out of ten plagues. And the plagues are also considered God's judgments, God's miracles, but they also can be seen as God's mercy because opportunity after opportunity, God was giving Pharaoh a chance to bend the knee, to humble himself, and to acknowledge that God is God, that he is the one in control. And he would tell them to let his people go. But Pharaoh kept hardening his heart, even when the consequences became more and more severe. God's word is reliable. He gives us a warning, and then he follows it with action. God will judge rebellion. He warned Pharaoh straightforward, if you don't let my firstborn the nation of Israel go free, then I will deal most harshly with your firstborn. Pharaoh heard the word of God, but he did not heed the word of God. 
And neither night, um, lice nor locusts, flies nor frogs, boils, hail, or darkness would change his hard heart. I'm going to read out of Exodus 11, verses 4 through 10. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And this is the exchange that Moses had with Pharaoh there in the palace. And I, we believe it was that last conversation that he was going to have with him. This is what the Lord says. At midnight tonight, I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt, from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has ever heard before or will ever hear again. But among the Israelites, it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. All the officials of Egypt will run to me and fall to the ground before me. Please leave, they will beg. Hurry and take all your followers with you. Only then will I go. Then burning with anger, Moses left Pharaoh. Now the Lord had told Moses earlier, Pharaoh will not listen to you, but then I will do even more mighty miracles in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed these miracles in Pharaoh's presence, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he wouldn't let the Israelites leave the country. God looked at the children of Israel collectively as his firstborn son. This expresses a relationship that God had. These were his people that he had chosen for himself. They were treasured, privileged, and they were to be honored. Not because they were honorable in and of themselves, but it was because who they belonged to. They belonged to the Lord. In Deuteronomy 7, 7, we're told that the Lord didn't choose you because you were big or great or anything special about you. The, the Lord chose you because he decided to set his love upon you and because he was keeping an oath that he had made your forefathers. It was only by God's grace that the Israelites could say that they were the chosen nation. It's always by God grace, God's grace that he chooses. Pharaoh had killed the firstborn of Israel. Now God is foretelling the tenth and final plague which was the death of the firstborn man and beast. If you look at Exodus 12, 29, there's this phrase that you can underline that says, and it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. It came to pass. God said it. He warned them and he fulfilled his word. What God says he will do, what he promises he will fulfill, what he declares will be accomplished. You know, before I even got this assignment that I had these chapters um, to share with you, I feel like the Lord was already prepping my heart. Um, those of us who read the one-year Bible, um, we've been in the book of Ezekiel for several weeks now. And Ezekiel was God's prophet. Um, a prophet of God, just like Moses, was a mouthpiece of God. And so when he spoke to the people, he wasn't just speaking as a man. He was speaking as from the Lord. The Lord would give him a message. And do you know what Ezekiel's message was? And it's continuous. I mean, we're already halfway through, you know, the book, and it's, it's, it's remaining the same. It's, Ezekiel is pleading with the people, and he's saying, repent. Repent. This is, he's speaking to Israel now, years later. You know, after God had been so faithful to them, they turned their back on their king, on their Lord. And he's saying, repent. Turn back to God. Turn back to God. And do you think that they listened? No. And the, and the, and the message remains the same and the same. And he's saying, judgment is coming. He's warning them of judgment. And you can't get through a paragraph in the book of Ezekiel without hearing this particular phrase. And it's this, the sovereign Lord. And it's repeated over and over. When Ezekiel speaks, he speaks as for the sovereign Lord. And you read it so much that I thought to myself, I better look up sovereign because I think I know what it means, but this is repeated. It's the most repetitive title given. And sovereign means supreme ruler. 
It means the greatest in authority. So when God is speaking, he is the supreme ruler. He's the greatest in authority. How dare the people not listen? How dare we not listen when the sovereign Lord speaks to us? Ezekiel 12, 28 says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. None of my words will be delayed any longer. Whatever I say will be fulfilled, declares the sovereign Lord. In Isaiah 14, 24, everything that I have planned will happen just as I said. And in 1 Peter 1, 24, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. There's a song that our worship team sings, but it's um, from Hillsong, and it's called So Will I. And it slays me every time we sing it. But there's this particular verse that I, is so fitting for what we're learning today. And it says, God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. And didn't we see that last week with God's voice? I mean, the frogs came up out of the sea. The hail came down from heaven. God's voice speaks with authority. When he says something, we need to listen and we need to obey. I was at the store last week and I was at the deli counter and there was a man there on the phone and he had his young son with him and I was behind him in line and he's trying to get the instructions from his, you know, probably from his wife, like what he needs to buy and his little boy had his t-shirt by his teeth. Can you, he was clamped on like this and he's tugging at his dad like this on his t-shirt and the dad's on the phone like trying to talk to his wife and he starts off, stop son. Son, stop. And you can tell every time he has to repeat himself, his tone gets a little stricter, a little more serious. Okay, it meant nothing to this child. He continued, right? And then the empty threats started coming. Do you need a timeout? Do I need to start counting? Then to do, we're going to put your treats back if you don't stop, okay? All right. A few minutes later, I'm walking out, putting my groceries away. There's the son still tugging on his dad, walking through the parking lot. <laughs> and I think sometimes, do we think that of our Lord, like he can speak, but we don't really necessarily need to listen to him? We can just go about our bad behavior? No, when God speaks, he speaks with authority. You know, when God spoke, the universe leapt into existence. When Jesus spoke, the wind and the sea obeyed him. And to think that he condescends to you and to me, and he wants to speak to us. When we open the word of God, ladies, that's, the, that's Jesus speaking. That's him speaking to us. If we will hear his voice, he will speak. We just need to say, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. You know, the question is, um, isn't, is he speaking? It's, are we listening? He's leading, but are we following? He's gently, mercifully convicting us of sin, but are we repenting? Every time that we come face to face with the word of God and he tells us what is good and right and true and befitting a follower of Jesus, he tells us. And when we don't obey him, that Holy Spirit gives us that conviction, right? And we need to be quick to repent and to follow his ways because we don't want to get that hard heart. You know, whenever I'm um, scheduled to teach, I, I really rely on my family. It's kind of like a family affair when I teach, and I ask them to please do this. I say, would you please read the chapters that I'm supposed to um, be teaching on and just give me your feedback. Tell me if there's anything, you know, you didn't quite understand or something that really spoke to you because I feel like if you have a question, the ladies will probably have a question. And they're usually pretty good about it. My husband gave me his feedback. My daughter gave me her feedback. And then my son is a little elusive. Um, even though both my kids live under my roof, I, I rarely see them. And I was just 
saying, Jeremiah, do you think you can uh, sit down with me and just tell me your thoughts? And it was always, Mom, I've got to go to work, or Mom, I've got to go here, do there, do this, or I'm going to be with my girlfriend, or whatever. And finally, I was just, I was literally begging him. I said, Jeremiah, please, do you have just 15 minutes that you can sit down with me? And so he made time, we sat down, and I said, okay, um, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be discussing chapter 11. Can we read chapter 11? Do you want to read or do you want me to read? And he said, well, why don't you read? And I said, oh, Jeremiah, will you just read it? <laughs> and he goes, Mom, you just asked me, <laughs> do you, I want to read it or do you want to read it? And you know what I said to him? I said, Jeremiah, I just want to hear your voice. And as I said that, I was thinking, I wonder if that's how God is with us. Is he pleading with us? Just give me 15 minutes. Just 15 minutes. I just want to hear your voice. You know, one of my favorite verses is, I think I wrote it down. It's Psalm 27, 8, and it's the psalmist, and he says, I've heard, hello, he says, my heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. That's the kind of love relationship that Jesus wants with us, that when we hear his word, that we would just run to hear his voice. Does it give you great comfort to know that God holds true to his word and he will accomplish his purposes? I hope it does. I hope it gives you great confidence. You know, I know that when I get discouraged, let's say, with my kids, I go to God's word and I cling to the promise that says, he who began a good work, and I just put their name in it, you can put your kid's name in there right there, he is faithful to complete it. The story's not over. God's still working. I know that when I get overwhelmed, I cling to the promise that as my eyes are fixed on him, that he will give me that perfect peace. I know that when I'm anxious, I believe the promise that if I will just pray, pray those anxieties to the Lord, that he will do this heavenly exchange with me and he will guard my heart and he will guard my mind and he will give me the comfort that I need. And that when I'm confused, whether it's just a circumstance or a trial, something that's going on in my life, I cling to the promise that he will never, no, never leave me nor forsake me. Even if the circumstances don't change, even if I don't see him working, I trust and believe that he is with me and he is working out his purposes, his good purposes for me in my life. His word is tried and true. He is his word and he is trustworthy, both the blessings and his judgment. Oftentimes, people who feel comfortable and like talking about God's love and his kindness and his beauty, and you know, that's all good. Those, that's awesome because that is all who God is. But we shouldn't focus on only those attributes in exclusion to his other attributes, such as his justice, righteousness, and his holiness. We must never forget that he is a holy a holy God. Holy means set apart. He is not like man. He is transcendent. He is above all things, and he is perfect in all his ways. He's not the man upstairs. He's not Santa Claus. He's not the tooth fairy. He's not a senile grandfather that you can manipulate. He's not an impersonal force of nature. Yes, he is benevolent, but it's his loving kindness and long-suffering that should lead us to repentance and obedience. However, I think people misinterpret his long-suffering and his patience with, with approval. Maybe they think, oh, God hasn't struck me with lightning yet. Maybe, you know, maybe he's turning a blind eye. Maybe what I'm doing is okay. But there comes a time when he will execute judgment. Reverent fear motivates us to obey the Lord's commands. I was reading an excerpt from A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, and this is what he says about the justice of God. He says, this vague hope that God is too kind to punish the ungodly has become a deadly opiate for the consciousnesses of millions. It hushes their fears and allows them to practice all pleasant forms of iniquity while death draws every day nearer and the command to repent goes unregarded. As responsible moral beings, we dare not so trifle with our eternal future. He cannot and will not turn a blind eye towards sin and rebellion. The wrath of God or the judgment of God is connected to the holiness of God. 
but we don't have to be under his wrath because he has made provision for us. And that is the good news of this passage, that he is the lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. It's his blood that atones for our sin. We don't have to suffer because he suffered in our place. You know, we looked at the reliability of God's word, that we need to know it. And my second point is the response to God's word. The response, we need to do it. In Exodus 12, the Lord is speaking to Moses. Do you notice the specific detailed instructions that he gives him? I'm going to read out loud, and I'm just going to read excerpts from Exodus 12, 1 through 13. I'm reading again from the New Living Translation. And it says, The Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter the lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. That same night, they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread without yeast. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. When you read that, did it seem kind of strange to you? Did you ask yourself, how does the blood of a lamb protect me? And I'm sure the Hebrews were asking that same question. But we're told the significance of this blood. It served, first of all, as a sign. It was an outward expression of their faith that they believed God. When God said, this is what's going to happen, this is what you need to do, they believed God. That was an act of faith. And it was a sign. And it was also protection. The blood kept them from being judged and destroyed. Ladies, if we understand this lamb, then we will understand the lamb. And you see that this is a foreshadow of the Old Testament, of that first Passover lamb. That first Passover lamb. And like, like I felt like after I read this, I understood why Jesus had to spill his blood. Why is he called the Lamb of God? You know, when we understand this significant Lamb. Through Jesus, through his sinless life and sacrificial death, Jesus became the only one capable of giving people a way to escape judgment and death and a sure hope of eternal life. The New Testament teaches that Jesus became our Passover. He is that perfect lamb. He is the sacrifice. He is our substitute. And when I was considering the blood of Christ and all that it signifies um, and all that it accomplishes, I started just writing a list, and I realized that as I, it's not an exhaustive list, but as I was writing, I was thinking, you know, the blood of Christ, it's not just a noun. I'm not just looking at the blood of Christ. I'm looking at it as a verb, what it does, what it accomplishes. And this is, these, are the, these are the things that the blood of Christ does for, for you and I. It delivers us from bondage. It frees us from sin. It cleanses our conscience. It reconciles us with God. It declares us righteous. It gives us access into the throne room of God. It saves us from judgment and hell. And it guarantees our inheritance in heaven. And I know you can add to that list. Even as we were singing, I jotted down, you know, it's precious. It's priceless. It's powerful. We sang that this morning the blood of the lamb, the blood of Christ. You know, as I was thinking about it, I had this flashback 
of me being a little girl. I come from a family where my mom is one of 11 in her family. She comes from a big Puerto Rican family. And when I was little, and all, really all through my formative years, we would gather together a lot with my aunts. There, I had nine of them, nine girls in the family, 11 children. And I knew that three things were going to happen when I gathered with my, with my aunts. And one, we were going to eat really good food because they are really good cooks. So whether they were making pasteles together or bringing their arroz and gondules or their, you know, platanos or whatever it was, we were going to eat good. Secondly, I knew that there was going to be dancing. I, something about Puerto Ricans, Latin women, when they hear music, they just can't help it, right? They just start dancing. And a dance party would break out at any moment and all the time, whether it would be in the you know, living room or in the kitchen, there would be dancing. But then I also know that they would pray together. And I'm so uh, blessed to have come from a legacy of women that love Jesus. And I would hear them pray. And did you know, ladies, that you learn to pray when you hear other people pray? It expands your own prayer language. And I remember being a little girl, and one aunt in particular, my titi Iris, she would always pray and plead the blood of the lamb. And she would pray that the blood of the lamb would cover our home in every corner of the house and that nothing that was not of the Lord would come in and that she would plead the blood of the lamb over our family. And, and you know, you would think that as a little girl hearing about blood, you know, pleading blood, maybe that that would be kind of scary. But you know what? I was never frightened. And even though I didn't know the fullness of what she was praying, I knew that there was something about this blood that was powerful. The blood of the lamb is powerful, but it needs to be applied to our lives. This last plague was going to require an act of faith in order to be spared from judgment. Any family that did not follow God's instructions was going to suffer. The only protection was the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. Can you imagine this scene, ladies? Each family took a lamb into their home and they cared for it for four days. Now, their homes weren't like our homes. It's not like we can put, you know, the lamb in the garage in a kennel somewhere for four days and then bring it back out. This little lamb was brought into their home, into their living space. They had to care for it. They had to inspect it. They had to, you know, take care of it. And then came the day when the father had to slaughter this innocent animal. And could you just hear the protests? Can you hear the son say, Dad, do you have to do it? Do you have to kill the lamb? And the father would have had to tell his son, either the lamb dies or you die. That's the scene here. So what was the response to the instructions that were given? To their credit, at this point, they were obedient. Verse 27 and 28 says, so they bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so just as the Lord had commanded. They heard the word of the Lord and they responded. And ladies, that's what is required of us. James 1.22 says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're just fooling yourselves. God will bless you for doing it. Ladies, God will always bless obedience. When he says something, when you hear his word, obey it, even if you don't fully understand it. Obey it, and he will bless you for it. We need to respond to what God commands. We need to apply the truth of his word because it's not enough to just admire Christ or to acknowledge Christ. It's not enough to say, oh, yeah, Jesus was a good teacher, a good role model. Oh, yes, he did die on a cross. You know, that's, that's, that's admiring what he did. That's acknowledging what he did. But that's not applying the blood. Applying the blood means putting our faith in Jesus. It's by personalizing what Christ has done for us. It's saying, Jesus is my Savior. He is my substitute. His innocent blood was shed for me. When we do this, we are applying the blood of the Lamb, and we are covered, and we are protected, and we are saved. That's that word, saved. We, don't, we no longer have to fear death. We are saved. Applying the blood brings salvation. 
when you apply that blood, you are saved. That brings your salvation. But living by applying his word, that brings sanctification. Do you understand that? When we live by applying the word of God, we hear it, we do it, that's what's going to sanctify us. That's what's going to grow us, mature us, transform us, change us. That's what we need to continue to do. In verse 50, there's that phrase, and it came to pass, and it came to pass that on that same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Here comes God's blessing, just as he said it would happen. And did you notice that they left with parting gifts? God gave them favor, and they left with gold and silver. God's word always comes to pass. It happened just as he said. Promises, that were, promises were fulfilled that night that were made to Abraham centuries before. So we need to know it, we need to do it, and we don't want to forget it. My third and final point is the remembrance of God's word. Verse 14 says, This day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Remember this day. Keep this ordinance. The Passover meal was to be an annual observance. And isn't that what holidays are? Days set aside to honor a person or an event. I mean, just on Monday, we observed Veterans Day where we honored the men and women who um, fight and, and who sacrifice their lives so that we can enjoy the freedom that we have. Um, all of us who have families, don't we love Mother's Day and that observance where we get honored for the sacrifices that we make as moms to our children? In Exodus 13, 8, it says, And you shall tell, or you shall explain to your son in that day, saying, This is what is done because this is, I'm sorry, this is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And so the Lord is saying, you need to speak these things to your children. Think, speak the goodness and the faithfulness of why we do this Passover ceremony. And ladies, we have to really be careful because a lot of times with our celebrations, we need to go back and remember why we do what we do because sometimes the tradition can take over. Like even at Christmas, right, we can get so wrapped up in the decor and the presents that we forget the significance of that celebration. That's our Messiah, our promised Messiah being born, right? And, you know, Thanksgiving is, is just right around the corner. And I think, isn't this a wonderful reminder that maybe this Thanksgiving, go around the table and ask your children, ask your family to remember God's faithfulness. How has he blessed you this year? Make sure that you celebrate Thanksgiving. There's this, I, this push where we almost go from Halloween to Christmas, right? Where we kind of forget about, about Thanksgiving. But we need to remember the significance of why we do what we do. Don't forget, um, just recently, Bob and I celebrated our 15-year cancer-free um, celebration of just remembering that, you know, it was 15 years ago that Bob was diagnosed with melanoma. And what's really interesting is that we don't celebrate like every year, like, oh, another year. We just live in the victory that God has given us. We don't, we don't really ever talk about cancer. Um, but interestingly enough, maybe because it's 15 years and it's, and it's a milestone, I heard Bob talking to, to Savannah in the kitchen recently, and he was telling her about his diagnosis and his surgeries and, you know, the treatment that had to be done. Because in her little mind, you know, she was only four years old when we went through this. And what she recollects is just that her dad wasn't able to get off the couch. She remembers tubes coming from his leg and blood and bruises and bandages, but she didn't know too much beyond that. And as he was sharing, the most significant part of what he was telling her was that he got to share with her how he prayed and how he pleaded with the Lord. And his prayer was, Lord, just spare my life so that I can raise my babies. That was the prayer. And God, in his grace, answered. And now Bob will tell you, you know, his, our kids are big. They're 20 and 21. So he feels like any time that God gives him now is just bonus time. 
And you know, when God has been so faithful to us by his grace, what do we do with that? You know, how do we express that appreciation back to the Lord? You know, God doesn't require sacrifices anymore. That system was done away with after Jesus became our perfect sacrifice. But the Bible does say that we are to become that living sacrifice, that our lives, in light of all that Jesus has done for us, we are to become that living sacrifice that is wholly devoted to him. Because that is our reasonable service when we considered all that he has done on our behalf Ladies, we need to walk in that grace. We need to walk um, that life that would be honoring to the Lord, worthy of our calling. That's how we respond to this great sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. I just want to leave you with one more thought. Did you know that Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples? You read about it in Luke 22, 14. It says, when the hour had come, He sat down with the 12 apostles and he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew he was going to die for them. And he's having this meal, this Passover meal. And he says in verse 19, and he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're reminded to look back. But we're also reminded to look forward because Jesus said himself in this final Passover, he goes, I'm not going to eat this meal again till I'm sitting with you in heaven and we're partaking together. This is what we have to look forward to. The Passover in the Old Testament was looking forward to the promised Messiah. And the Passover in the New Testament, or the Lord's Supper, is the New Testament fulfillment of that promise. We don't have time because our time is up, but I want to give you an extra credit assignment, okay? Because I know you girls are students of the word. Will you sometime this week read the fullness of Revelation 5? Revelation 5, because the Lamb of God that we're studying today is the very Lamb of God that we will be worshiping in that day when we're with him in heaven. And I'll leave you with this verse. It's a scene of a future day when every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth will be worshiping and we will be falling on our faces and we will be singing, blessing, Honor, glory, and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for just meeting with us this morning and opening up your word to us, God. I pray that our faith would be solely relied on you, Lord, because your word is reliable. I pray that we would know it, that we would have the desire to hear your voice and obey it. And Lord, I just thank you for this collective group of women that love your word. I pray that you would bless them. I pray, Lord, that if any of them, Lord, um, maybe haven't applied that blood to to their hearts, to their lives today, Lord, that they would simply with a prayer say, Lord, I believe you. Lord, forgive me. And Lord, you will come in and you will save because you are the God who saves and delivers and gives life and gives freedom. We love you, Jesus. Amen.